Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Public Safety Subcommittee. I'd like to start off with a welcome. We have a guest all the way from Canada. We have the um, Deputy Chief, if you can please stand up and get recognized. And thank you for visiting our great city. With that, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Um, has anybody had a chance of the call to the public? We do have one card. Tom? Dixon? Yeah. Come on down. We have about two minutes. Good morning. Uh, I am Tom Dickinson. I appreciate the opportunity to practice this democracy. Uh, so I'm here today. Uh, Zika virus and uh, West Nile virus is uh, going to, well, Zika is going to come to Phoenix. And we have the Zika mosquitoes. So this is a bat house. And so YouTube uh, building bat houses, it'll show you how to make them. They need to be about this size because they, they raise their young in here too. Uh, they raise their young in here too. Uh, and then the other thing is, um, if I get you to web browse, uh, Italy has just passed a law, uh, or their education department has uh, passed a law on uh, climate change in public schools. It's going to be part of their curriculum. That's all I know. Well, thank you so much. And we have, I think that's it for public comment. Um, has anybody had a chance to read the minutes of the last meeting? Move approval. All right, we got a motion to approve. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motions carry. All right, we're on um, consent items two through seven. I'd move approval if no one has questions. Okay, we have a motion to approve. Do we have a second? Second. All right, we have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motions carry. All right, we're moving on here. Next, we're on item. Let's see, what are we said? Item number eight. Eight through nine. Okay, so we have um, information only, um, items eight and nine. I'm not sure if anybody needs um, any updates or anything on this. Most of us already got informed. If not, we'll go straight to item number 10. Yes, yeah. Council Member um, Garcia. Yeah, so for, I think this is a good place to do it. We had an, an incident out in, uh, on the west side and I wanted to ask for information about um, Immigration and Customs Enforcement and our relationship to them. Uh, if we could get the numbers to how many people we're, we've transferred over and how long we're keeping people um, before we transfer them over. Um, <clears throat> I also want particularly to understand how we interpreted uh, the Secretary Brnovich's uh, memo from three years ago, 2016, about how we, uh, how our relationship with ICE works and how long we keep people uh, waiting until ICE comes to pick them up. So maybe we can do that for a future agenda item, if you can bring all that information to us and, um, and maybe you can update um, Councilman Garcia before the next meeting. I'm not sure if any of my other colleagues would like that information. Yeah, no, that, that'd be great um, to be able to get that information. I support that. Um, but I also wanted to make um, comments on, on item eight on the agenda. Um, I just want to thank everyone for all the reports. I spoke recently with Dr. DeBlox, the superintendent of the Pentagrass Elementary School District and also one of the founders of the Speak Up and Stand Up Save a Life. She noted that the success of their event relies on the involvement of over 500 community volunteers. This is a lot of volunteers, and so I would like to know what the City of Phoenix is doing to assist in organizing volunteers and publicizing the need for volunteers. And there is also a need for public safety to be available during this year's event at GCU. So I would like to ask staff to ensure that we have fire and e EMT personnel on call for that day. Yes, we'll do that. Who do we have? 
Can I have somebody to try to answer that question for you? Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning. And, uh, my name is David Ward. I'm the Assistant Director of the Public Defender's Office. This is Sal Obregon. He's our uh, office uh, administrator. Uh, we are the ones that the point right now for the Public Defender's Office for the, the Speak Up, Stand Up, Save a Life. And so, yes, we absolutely, uh, uh, we're, we're very supportive of this, and we appreciate your support and your, and your questions. Uh, any question we could help uh, the support with that. We've also had uh, contact, of course, it's a broad spectrum of people that are being involved. Uh, the county attorney's office, I believe the prosecutor's office is involved. So there's a lot of people that are being involved. We really, uh, we were, yesterday there was a, uh, we're going to be doing adult facilitators, so we're always requesting and needing more and more people that can help us with that. So anybody that can come help facilitate that uh, would be greatly help, uh, greatly useful and uh, very welcome. We are, uh, right now, uh, it's going to, the conference, I'm sorry, is going to be on uh, the 21st of January. So if there's any questions or anything else I can help you with. Thank you so much. All right. And, and one second, what it really is, is, is and maybe people understand it, is, is it really is an emphasis to try to help uh, basically with the crisis that's happening with some of our young people, mostly in suicides, bullying, and some of the different things, that, serious traumas that are happening. And this is a, a, an attempt to help them give an outlet about how they can uh, reach out to adults through their peers. And this is an educational process that helps them do that. Well, I just want to thank you all. It's something that's really important, especially for parents that are going through uh, with dealing with teenagers that might be struggling and talking about suicide and this and that. So a youth conference is ideal. So it's going to be at the Grand Canyon um, University. It'll be on um, January 20, 21st. So. And they're anticipating about 3,000 children or 3,000 kids there. So it's, it's going to be a very big process. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions on the um, police um, department's diversity update? The only thing I would ask is that we have percentages. That looks great. Can we get like numbers, sort of like how you did the, um, when you did the hiring, you actually put percentages plus the number of people. So maybe next time just give us a, some numbers. With that, we're on item number 10, vaping. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. Um, my name is Yesenia Do. I'm with the Office of Government Relations. And, and I know that at one of the previous subcommittees, there was a presentation that really focused on vaping from a national perspective and also from a health perspective. And today, what I would like to do is give a little bit of background on some of the things that have happened at the legislature regarding the topic of vaping and also some of the things that we expect to come up this upcoming legislative session. Last session, there were competing efforts to try to address the issue of vaping among youth. The first effort was Senate Bill 1147. What this bill, in short, attempted to do was raise the age um, to 21 for buying any tobacco products. But what it would have also done is preempted cities and town from having any additional regulations at the local level. Um, it's important to note that this bill was being supported and backed by the vaping industry. The other bill was House Bill 2357. This bill would have redefined tobacco products to include vaping under the Smoke-Free Arizona Act, which prohibits smoking in most enclosed public places. Next session, it is my understanding the Senator Carter, who was the sponsor of House Bill 2357, plans to introduce a bill that would define vaping as tobacco products. It would raise the age from 18 to 21 for the purchase of these products, and it would also set a requirement for businesses that sell traditional tobacco products to have a, li a license at the state level, a retail license. Um, this approach will continue to allow cities to take additional F um, actions to regulate at the local level, like, for example, zoning regulations, 
Um, and there is also the possibility, like last session, that there are competing <coughs> efforts to try to address this issue um, and that they may be looking at different ways uh, of solving it. So it's an issue that we'll be monitoring and being engaged in to ensure that there are no preemption efforts for the city. Hi, Mr. Chairman and subcommittee members. I'm Julie Cree with the Law Department. And we wanted to also mention that there are currently about five cities that have local ordinances already in place. Um, these five cities regulate the business of selling uh, vaping products, not the consumer use of them. Um, Surprise is also considering enacting something in the next uh, few months. These are some of the concepts that have come up in regards to um, vaping products, raising the age to purchase or consume from 18 to 21, banning flavored e-cigarettes, ensuring that the smoke-free laws include e-cigarettes, implementing zoning restrictions for vendors, and licensing and regulating vendors. This includes ensuring that vendors follow you know, one through four. Um, currently, the, there has been a letter from um, a representative to the AG's office asking for an opinion on whether the cities that have enacted those ordinances are allowed to do that or whether the state has preempted the area. And the Arizona League has recently responded with an opinion from those five cities that it's not a preemption and that those cities are allowed to regulate. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I also wanted to add that currently Tempe and most recently the city of Mesa have uh, adopted ordinances that prohibit vaping in the same manner in places where smoking tobacco is prohibited um, at the local level. And there are a few other cities that have done this as well, like Chandler and Gilbert. And with that, we're happy to answer any questions. Any questions for my colleagues? Uh, Mr. Chair, if I might. So could the city, um, do we have to wait for the legislature to see if they do something, or can we proceed to take this up and perhaps adopt something? I mean, I like what's been done in the other cities. We keep reading more and more about, especially young people, teenagers, having brain damage and all the effects of these chemicals, and it's very concerning. Um, Mr. Chairman and subcommittee members, certainly that is up to council. We can go ahead and consider taking action similar to the other cities. We don't have any idea, of course, how quickly the AG's office might consider um, the challenge from the lawmakers or whether the legislature might act this session or not. I don't know if, if we could go ahead and draft some language and then in case it fails at the legislature, um, we could adopt something. Mr. Chairman and Councilwoman Williams, um, yes, so there, there are definitely different approaches to, to try to do at the local level like we have seen with other cities. Um, as Julie mentioned, there are five cities that have done the Tobacco 21, raising the age to purchase to 21. But like I mentioned, there are also other cities like Mesa and Tempe who have only dealt with the smoking in public places. So there are definitely different type of approaches that can be taken. and and as staff, we're happy to compile information as to what the city can do and present it to the full council uh, for consideration and, and maybe have a, a better, a more dialogue to see what direction the city of Phoenix would like to take. Um, maybe like at a policy session and, and provide more information as to what the city can do so that we can give all that information to, to both mayor and council. I'm wondering if, I, I'd like to move that we ask staff to draft some language 21, uh, the flavored, gone, and that uh, it applies wherever other smoking rules. That's three I remember from the list. And then I think that's um, implementing some type of zoning restrictions for vendors. Yeah, where they can be sold. Mr. Chairman, yes, just sir. wanted to verify that we uh, raise the limit to 21 to purchase, remove flavor, um, banning the flavor uh -huh. and then can't vape where you smoke, where you can't smoke in public. Right. 
Okay. And then implementing some type of a zoning a restriction for vendors where they need to be licensed. Yes, sir. So if, if you could um, maybe draft something and then present it to the mayor and see if the mayor would put it on a on a formal um, agenda, that would be great. Our policy. Our policy. Not ready. Any other questions, concerns? Thank you so much. And now we're on item number 11, police response to alarm calls. Oh, I'm sorry. I had some cards, I think, didn't I? Yes. Yes, you did. Uh, let me go back to number 10 really quick. I'm s sorry about that. Is it Jeannie? Jeannie. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. Oh, no problem. Okay. Maybe raise my hand. Uh -huh. Hi, I'm Jenny Chadwick. I'm with the Preventing Tobacco Addiction Foundation, Tobacco 21. So we're the national organization that works across the country to um, pass Tobacco 21 policy. And I'm actually based in Columbia, Missouri. And I was on the Columbia, Missouri City Council when we passed one of the very first Tobacco 21 policies in 2014. Just to give you an idea of like how fast this has moved. So when Columbia passed it, we were the 32nd city in the nation to pass it. We had 2% of the population passed. We now have 58% of the US population passed. And although there's only five cities in um, Arizona, there's 530 two cities and counties across the country and you are the only major metropolitan city on the list that has not had uh, their own individual ordinance and so oftentimes this does move at a local level first and then the state level and most of those cities who have passed the policy like they have it before the state does because sometimes it takes the state a little bit of time to act or they make their policy a little bit more stringent than the state level right so that they do do restrictions on maybe the zoning of distance from schools or or other issues um, giving you a local license gives you the ability to suspend or revoke that license for repeat violations, and we know that that's the way to get retailers to comply with the policy. Um, and so when, when we talk about the action of the state and there's a challenge, so we've seen a couple of you know, legal challenges along the way. Arizona is in a gray area, right? You don't have explicit authority to pass it, but um, there's definitely precedents for passing it. And so we would really recommend that you um, take the authority and act. Um, and, and not wait for the state um, to, to do so. So thank you so much for the time. And um, you know, our organization is happy to help with um, drafting language that looks like other cities of your size around the country. Thank you so much. Maybe we can have staff uh, speak with you to, to see what we can do in working together. And then is there Brian? Thank you, Chairman Nowakowski, members of the council. My name is Brian Hummel. I'm the Arizona Director of Government Relations for the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. I'm based here in Phoenix. Um, I want to thank this committee for uh, bringing this tobacco control discussion to the public um, at ACS CAN. And my colleague from the American Heart Association is here as well. She asked me to uh, add her to my, uh, to my comments. Um, but we think it's important that uh, the tobacco control efforts that, that you address be comprehensive and evidence-based. Uh, and we stand ready to work with you and the staff to, to make uh, Phoenix ordinances strong and protect our youth. So thank you for, again, for bringing this discussion to the public. Thank, thank you. you so much. Now we're on item number um, 11. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the subcommittee. We are here today to discuss police response to alarm calls for service. If you recall, at the last subcommittee, we examined seven different agencies to take a deeper look at the way that they conduct business regarding alarms. What we did in this report is we looked at a report that was authored by um, SEAC, which is the Security Industry Alarm Coalition, and it is attached for your review. 
And what they are, are they are a nonprofit organization that partners with the International Association of Chiefs of Police and the National Sheriff's Association. This report um, was published in 2018 and is a collection of 20 years worth of data for agencies nationwide. And it lists the six best elements for best practices for agencies across the nation. The first element that is described is enhanced call confirmation, which Phoenix um, does has implemented the three call verification. They did this in May of 2010. So what that means is the alarm company must call the premises first, <clears throat> excuse me, and then make a minimum of two additional phone calls to uh, responsible parties in an attempt to contact somebody there to verify the alarm. The second element is standardized control panels. This particular item was removed in 2016 due to evolving technology and the fact that alarm uh, manufacturers are already implementing the, this item. The third element is the requirement of an alarm permit and a permit fee uh, that has to be renewed annually. This is something that Phoenix Police currently does. Um, it's, it's in the city's alarm ordinance. The fourth element is a reasonable fee schedule for false alarms and a limited number of free false alarm responses. This is also something that's described in the city's code. They allow one free false alarm in a 365 day period. And after that, the alarm company and the alarm subscriber share responsibility and they're subject to an assessment. The fifth element described is ceasing response to chronic abusers. While Phoenix Police does not cease response, um, there are some things that the department does do. So once a system incurs 10 or more false alarms, they are subject to an alarm inspection, which requires a Phoenix Police Department employee to respond to that location with the, uh, one of the alarm installation technicians to examine the equipment to ensure that it's working properly and to bring the system into compliance. The system is also subject to a class one misdemeanor citation for additional penalties after that inspection has been completed. The sixth and final element is the acceptance of alarm dispatch cancellations. And in 2017, the department did implement ASAP to PSAP, which is computer aided dispatch that allows for those cancellations to come through. I also wanted to highlight the action plan that the department is currently working on to further reduce the occurrences of false alarms. We're currently working with the legal department on updating the current uh, alarm ordinance to address evolving technology. We have also initiated an audit of the fee structure. What we have found is that neighboring agencies have more of a tiered approach, whereas we have a fixed fee. So we are looking to see if there is a better um, approach to those fees. And finally, the current database will be replaced with new technology. We do a lot of processes on paper. This new database will allow subscribers to create an account online, to uh, apply for their permits, to uh, renew their permits, to do online training, and uh, to opt in for electronic notification versus mail. And with that, we'll answer any questions you might have. Any questions for my colleagues? Well, just want to thank you for, you know, the information and for updating the um, current ordinance on the alarms that we have out there and basically coming up with a new database. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All righty. We're on item number 12, which is our state and federal legislative um, agenda. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. Uh, thank you for allowing us, um, the Government Office of Government Relations, the opportunity to share with the subcommittee the items from our draft legislative agenda. 
uh, related to this subcommittee. This is our last presentation to the subcommittees for the year, and I know you guys have a full agenda, so we will uh, run through it. I'm Frank McCune, Director of Government Relations, and with me is Asenia Dote, Manager of State Relations, and Clark Prinsell, Manager of Federal Relations. As a reminder, we, um, through the fall, have worked with the departments to reach out to each director in the department to identify issues that um, might be upcoming in the session that they're interested in and potential legislation they might be looking forward to. Um, taking those um, draft ideas to each of you in your council offices to talk those through, get your feedback and ideas and suggestions, and have, are presenting the draft legislative agenda on upcoming issues that may impact the city. Um, as a reminder, we operate from four guiding principles at the state level to filter proposed and potential legislation through for a response from the city. Number one, being always working to preserve state shared revenues. Second, opposing unfunded mandates that might come and fund the city, working to protect local authority, and lastly, preserving water resources. To run through our state legislative agenda, Yesenia will cover those items now. Thank you. Good morning. The first item is increasing funding for police officer training. Uh, revenues in the Criminal Justice Enhancement Fund have been declining for the past several years, and a portion of these funds pay for training police officers. Staff recommends supporting efforts to seek additional funds to help pay for candidates in the Phoenix Police Training Academy. Um, in addition, I would like to know that for the past couple sessions, we have been su successful in advocating for additional funding for this, um, and uh, part of that is, uh, as a city, we, we help train um, police officers from some smaller jurisdictions and so it's very important that the Academy is properly funded second item is related to firefighter cancer prevention in 2017 the legislature passed legislation that established a presumption of compensation for a fighter fighters disability or death caused by certain cancers that are listed in statute this interim, the Arizona State Senate created an ad hoc committee to look at ways that the state could address this issue. Um, the purpose of the committee was to research and make recommendations for future legislation um, to help with some of these um, issues at the state level. Um, there, there was recommendations made. There were a total of nine of them, and we will be distributing the full recommendations to council and mayor this afternoon. Uh, government relations will continue to be involved in discussions discussions with stakeholder discussions at the state capitol as the language for this legislation begins to be developed um, and we will be providing regular updates to the council staff recommends supporting efforts to pass legislation that first protects all of our first responders and also provides additional funding um, at the local level As it relates to our 911 public safety system, staff recommends continuing to work with our 911 administrator and our regional partners to ensure that there is efficient distribution of resources for the 911 system. And while um, the protection of our state share revenues remains a priority, there are other um, public safety related uh, funding that are important to the city and some of them are um, the ACTIC, which is the Arizona Counterterrorism Information Center. ACTIC is a program of DPS, but as a city, we are very involved in their mission and we have police officers that help drive that mission. Um, second item is ensuring that there is sufficient monies for the internet crimes against children. And lastly, ensuring that there is an adequate amount of funding for the Arizona State Hospital to ensure the safety of residential areas around the, the Arizona State Hospital. Um, and so staff requests authority to pursue these public safety related funding. And lastly, increased resources for the mental health system. Staff recommends supporting efforts that allocate additional resources for the state's mental health system and to monitor and engage in any potential legislation that may involve police matters, um, police matters in, in the care of uh, mentally ill patients. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions as, as it relates to the state legislative agenda. Do we have any questions? No, but can we add vaping? Yes. Thank you. 
you know, I have a couple questions. Is um, basically with the homeless situation that we have, especially in the downtown and along our light rail um, corridors, can we make can we make sure that we advocate for more funding uh, for those cities that have programs and and advocate that all cities have some type of homeless program, not just the city of Phoenix, where we became the we're the mecca of um, homelessness because we're the only city or that provides the services that we provide from dental to housing to um, medical. And I know that there's other cities that do have smaller operations, but how can we start to spread it out throughout the region, right? The other thing is our 911 operators. That's something that we really need to look at. Um, uh, we've been over and over, I know that my office has been getting calls from our employees saying that there's a need for more 911 operators and if there's somehow we give us more relief funding from the state level that'd be excellent and I'm not sure if there's anything else any yeah. of my colleagues have yeah I had um, a question around because you said something about what well, what would it look like to expand um, 911 operators um, throughout the valley what would, what would that look like is that a conversation that you guys are in Mr. Chairman, Vice Mayor, um, so as far as what that would look like, we are not currently engaged in those discussions, but I know that in collaboration with our regional partners and our 911 administrator, um, they collaborate very closely with the Arizona Department of Administration since the Department of Administration provides grant opportunities and funding for the various 911 systems in the state. And so um, as far as getting more operators for the local system that we have in, the, the conversation would really, we would have to work with our administrator um, to, to start having those conversations with the Department of Administration to try to figure out what are some of the things that we need to do as a city um, to try to get additional funding for more operators. Yeah, because I, I, I mean, I would like to see a plan in terms of, you know, given the call volume, right, like the call volume is huge um, from, from what I can see. Like, I would like to see what a budget would look like in terms of, you know, what, what is it that we would have to add in the budget next year in terms of getting more operators. I, I mean, I was in their facil facility a few, a few weeks ago, and it's a, little, it's a little cramped, right? I don't see how we put more, more operators in there. So, so what does that mean if we add in more operators and we're trying to be more efficient and, you know, and we're also trying to be good to our 911 operators, what does that plan look like as well? Thank you. Any other questions or concerns? Just one other thing is uh, I know that our police officers are responsible for the health checks. I remember a while back that it was actually the um, state hospital that would actually um, be in charge of those health checks. Is there any way to advocate some type of a, a, a county or a state type of health check where we're not taking our police officers off the street to, uh, to do these types of checks. And if they are, that they are secondary enforcement, not the ones that actually are doing the check, but they can go with, uh, with an expert on mentally, um, mental health expert that can help uh, with those calls. Because um, many times we hear stories over and over that when you knock on the door, you might have somebody with a knife or our, our, our officers are trained to protect themselves also. So with an expert on mentally health issues can maybe help us with those health checks or so. So I'm not sure if there's, we can help actually introduce a bill or so that we can bring back that type of service and maybe support the, um, the state hospital for the mentally ill. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, we are currently engaging in conversations and, and gathering information and, and research so that we can have stakeholder discussions to address some of those issues. Because um, currently in state statute, we are mandated to do some of these requirements and we're trying to work with our partners to come up with solutions to alleviate um, some of these requirements from our police officers. Um, but we're engaging in those conversations so that we can find a, a statewide solution. Thank you so much. It's all yours. For the federal program, which has a major emphasis on funding and grant, um, grant exercise funding, um, 
Clark Prinsell will run through the federal agenda. As a reminder, the two guiding principles uh, that we operate from at the federal level are promoting fiscal sustainability and protecting local authority as well. Clark. Chairman and subcommittee members, on behalf of the police department, we'll continue to support their efforts to receive Department of Justice grants. These include grants like the Community Oriented Policing Services Grant or COPS grant. This is a grant that the department utilizes that helps offset the cost of new police hires in those first three years and also helping them to try to gather additional federal, re re federal resources to offset police technology enhancements. One of the um, issues that we're working on with them on this is the um, items that are needed to collect digital evidence in the collection and analyzing and storage of this evidence as that evidence becomes more and more important in their investigations. On behalf of the fire department, we'll continue to support their efforts to receive Federal Emergency Management Agency or FEMA grants. These include assistance to firefighter grants or AFG grants that they've utilized in the past to, for different equipment purchases they have, as well as federal resources they've received to support the urban search and rescue programs that the fire department um, has. On behalf of the Emergency Management Department, we'll continue to support their Homeland Security um, grant programs. One of the grant programs that we get every year, and it's a formula that we receive this funding in, is the Urban Area Security Initiative, or UASI grant. This is a grant which helps to fund the city's response and prevention capabilities to natural, human-caused, and terrorist crises. On behalf of the prosecutor's office, they receive federal resources to help support their specialty courts. The city has three specialty courts, the Veterans, Behavioral Health, and Domestic Violence Court. We'll continue to support their efforts to ensure that those grants continue to roll in and support those um, specialty courts. And then lastly, we'll continue to support funding for domestic violence programs and funding. Programs like the Violence Against Women's Act provides federal resources to provide funding for comprehensive responses to the needs of victims of violent crimes, such as domestic and sexual abuse. And many of these resources dollars are what help to support the city's family advocacy centers throughout the city. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Any questions from my colleagues? Councilmember Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Are there federal funds for uh, child abuse or uh, you know, all that goes in that territory? Chairman and Councilwoman Williams, um, there are overarching programs I know that help um, that fund certain programs that can be utilized to help either prevent or go after child abuse. Um, but I will do some additional digging to see yeah, if there's for any the trafficking programs. and all the other problems that we've had, I'd really like to see us do more in that area. My question is, can we um, advocate a little stronger for our Homeland Security grant programs? I believe that we're not getting our fair share. Um, being the fifth largest city, having a power plant just outside <coughs> of the city, um, uh, Palo Verde, a nuclear power plant, and there, there's a lot of homeland security issues with one of the largest airports that we have here, our tank farms and all that. I think that um, um, DC, Washington DC should understand that there is a, a major need and that also we're the hub when it comes to um, communication with other um, law enforcement throughout the uh, Maricopa County and throughout the state. So I'm not sure if we can even arrange some type of um, tour so they can actually see what our facilities are doing and how we, it's not just the city of Phoenix, but it's the whole county that we really help out. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, Lisa Jones and the emergency management team did lead, a re to your point, a regional effort in October with, into DC to help explain that and we'll continue to push those efforts to push that forward. All right. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. And, and Mr. Chairman and committee, if you guys are uh, done with any questions, we would ask for your approval to move forward on these agenda items. Any other questions? <clears throat> I think there's a, the one other thing I want to put out on the radar. There's a possibility that we do some a civilian review board, and I just want to make sure if something like that happens that we make sure that uh, we advocate at the state level to make sure we can have that autonomy to do so. Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, Council Member Garcia, absolutely. As items pop up that relate to any actions that Council's 
taking um, or anything related to these issues, we will make you aware and come to council for direction. Perfect. Mr. Chair, I move staff recommendation as amended by our comments. Already, we have a motion. Second. We have a second for the vice mayor. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? <laughs> motion carries. Thank you so much. From item number 13, this is an item that we carried from our last subcommittee meeting to make sure that um, Council Member Williams is here for it. Mr. Chair, I, I appreciate that. This is something that was um, Humane Society, uh, Dr. Hansen brought to me over a year ago. It was a problem uh, that our officers and the staff from the Humane Society were encountering. They didn't have uh, a humane answer. And uh, I'm very glad that you postponed it. And I think this is something that really will add to our community safety of our homes, our kids, and our animals. So I have a presentation. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, as Councilwoman Williams just described, um, this is an issue that is of concern to the city and to the Humane Society because it in, involves a situation where police take custody of an animal because they encounter them in situations where there is the owner or no other persons available to take care of the animal for its welfare. Might be a traffic accident or a rescue where someone's transported for medical attention. Several different situations could be an arrest. But police find themselves with an animal that needs to be cared for and no one to care for it. And the issue is that currently there is no um, city code provision that addresses this situation. The only provision in the city code um, applies to situations where an animal is seized because of concerns about cruelty to the animal and welfare of the animal. And that triggers a due process kind of criminal type system where the animal's held for at least 10 days, there's notice given um, to the owner, and the owner has to request a hearing that's then held in municipal court in order to get the animal um, returned and for someone to decide whether to return the animal. So we don't have a situation that's streamlined to address situations as I described with the welfare. Um, the city and police department um, contract with the Arizona Humane Society to, to take custody of these animals and to care for them, and they would currently be required to hold them for 10 days under what's there. Just to give you an idea of the scope of the issue, um, I believe this is data provided by the Humane Society on jurisdictions that they have contracts with or provide similar care. And obviously, Phoenix has the largest numbers. There were This is 2018 data. 297 animals were taken in this situation. 75% of those, the owners never contacted them to return the animal. But in the other cases, uh, 31 were returned within three days, 25 between four and 10 days, and then another 17 after the 10 days. So the majority, or 75%, that get returned happen in the first 10 days. And you see Phoenix is pretty much on par with the return percentages in the other jurisdictions. But obviously, the numbers with Phoenix size are much higher in Phoenix than the other jurisdictions. So based on this data and the return timeframes, what's recommended is that we repeal and replace the existing ordinance in the code that addresses the criminal um, process for possible cruelty to animals with um, a provision addressing specifically care of the animals when they're taken in the situations where they just need to be cared for and turned over to someone until the owner can reclaim them. It would reduce the hold time from 72 hours to, or to 72 hours from the 10 days. But I want to clarify that 72 hours or three days is the period of time that's a minimum before the Humane Society could proceed with adoption or placement of the animal in some other way. It doesn't mean that the owners couldn't retrieve the animal within three days. They could be retrieved as soon as someone is available and they can get there to work it out. I know there were some members that had concerns about what would happen and that people might have the animals taken out from under them or trans transferred to someone else because they were in the hospital or weren't able to contact. But we've had discussions with that and the Humane Society as well as the city try to avoid that situation. The goal of everyone is to reunite the animal with the owner. I don't know if there's any questions about that, but I believe Terry uh, Miller from the Humane Society could address that if there's any concerns. Sure. Councilmember Garcia? Um, I'm the one that brought that up and, and I think the, the reason I brought it up is both medical reasons or incarceration. If someone happens to go into those situations and they can't come back in three days, what we would hate to see is 
the 25 percent of people that do come back for their pets that that number even lessens because those pets are gone um i had an incident literally across at the at the intersection here about two weeks ago when a person was seemed to be mentally uh just not having a good day and, and they left the pet with one of the officers and kind of walked away I can see that person wanting to come back and recuperate the, the pet once they're feeling better or maybe that pet was who was going to get them to a better place. And so I just want to make sure that we add something there where we have options. Yes, if it's evident that, you know, the, someone is part of those 75 percent that they're never going to come back, can we expedite it and make sure that the pet gets where it needs to go? Yes. But just to make sure that those 25 percent of people, if they're unable to come back within three days, that their pet doesn't. Um, so some sort of special tag or probability that they are going to get recuperated or an understanding that, you know, someone was either incarcerated or is ill or whatever. Um, Mr. Chairman, Councilman Garcia, I, I would advise that the ordinance does require the peace officers to notify the owner and provide the contact information for the Humane Society and where the animal would go. So that's the starting point. But then um, I can let the Humane Society address how they handle it. Good morning. Tracy Miller with the Arizona Humane Society. I'm the field operations manager, and thank you for having me back. Um, to clarify your concerns, uh, the, of the 25%, um, about 15% of those are reclaimed from day four and after, and that would show that we are already currently working with the owners if they need extended period of time to ha house their animals with us. We also have two different programs that we can utilize if they need even longer term care. We have Project Assist, an emergency services program that we can put the animals in. They can get them out of the shelter environment into a foster home. And a foster family can watch the animal for an extended period of time if that's what is needed. Um, and I, I would also like to share with you, at the end of day three, that doesn't necessarily mean the animal immediately goes up for adoption. That means we start our process to get the animal adoptable ready. So that could take seven to 10 days for the animal to go through its medical procedures, get spayed and neutered if need to be, be behaviorally evaluated. So at the end of day three, if the rest of our procedures take 10 days, the animal's only with us for 13 days instead of waiting 10 days and then another 10 days and being with us for 20 days. Um, a couple of success stories that we've had that shows that we've worked with um, people who have been in a bad situation and need a little extra time is we had an owner who was actually hospitalized on three different occasions. And at each time, her animals were seized um, by the police because she had no one to take care of them. Her third hospitalization, she stayed in there for a little over a month. Uh, she was able to reach out to us and ask us if we could hang on to the animal during the time frame that she was in the hospital. And we did. And when she came out of the hospital, we were able to return animals to her. And most recently, I'm not sure if you saw the news article that was done of the veteran who was found uh, lying on his floor, actually, by one of my investigators. She went out to do a check welfare because the neighbors were concerned that the dogs were barking and they hadn't seen the owner. Um, she went out the first day, posted a notice, and the second day, she actually called police to come out and do a check welfare. When they went inside, they found that he was on the ground and not able to move and had been in that position for six days. Um, we were able to retrieve the animals right then and there and hold on to them. And uh, he was in the hospital for two weeks. After the end of his two week stay, uh, he asked us to rehome three of his animals. He felt he could not care for them, but we were able to reunite him with two of his animals. And the comment that he made when he picked up his animals to us was, when I saw the animal, he called us the animal cop, when the animal cop was there and she told the investigators uh, that were coming to pick me up because his animals were protecting him, they were growling and being a little aggressive because that's their owner. Um, she told the EMTs that were there, don't worry, he's, they're just protecting his owner or their owner. He said, when I heard that, I knew I was going to be okay and my animals were going to be okay. <laughs> Any other? Oh, okay, the, um, the benefits, obviously, of this option to the owners and the displaced animals is decreased length of stay in the shelter, as Terry mentioned. Um, it's better psychological for the psychological well-being of the animals. And the owners are not required to go through the court process. And the city and the Humane Society, the courts are not required to process that. And it can be done quicker. Benefits to the city eliminates unnecessary court procedures, decreases in-office or overtime, and the time that they have to spend attending the court appearances on these animals. 
um, that aren't really necessary because there aren't concerns with cruelty. Um, decreased use of mis municipal court resources, therefore, increased capacity to care for additional animals, and it moves the animals through the system quicker and gets the issues resolved. So that's um, all the information we have to present. Any questions or uh, comments? You know, I have two cards. Would you mind if we, okay. We have, uh, is it Naomi? Naomi. Naomi. Good morning, if you can just tell us your name. Uh, my name is Noemi Godinez, okay. and I am a pet owner. And um, I just would like to say that I think within more time, me as a pet owner, I would like to see just in case of an emergency or in case of anything, it would be a great idea to just increase it and not decrease it because time is always important in situations like this. I've lost pets, I've gotten my pet, you know, uh, sick, but in the case of myself being sick, I would love to see it just a little bit more because pets, you know, tend to take our hearts and be more than just pets. So time is crucial. And that's, I think that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any questions for, all right. And then we have Raul Bencomo. Uh, hi, uh, sorry. Hi, uh, good morning, uh, good morning. Council, uh, councilmen and women. Uh, my name is Raul Bencomo, um, uh, ASU student here. Uh, just wanted to mention that um, uh, I feel that um, there's there's a lot of uh, uh, I think other options that could be taken into consideration. Um, I recently did a a report. Um, I have some copies. I don't know if I'm allowed to give them to you. Uh, on um, you know pet recovery and how you know steps to take. Um, I work with some of the members for the a AHS, and uh, a lot of the comments from the uh, readers were really upset because I thought it was you know we were doing it as a kind of like a public service, like hey you know this is a great organization. Look look these are the steps. You know this this is the advice. Get your dog collared, microchipped, and all that. Um, and a lot of readers were upset. They're like, why didn't you tell us this earlier? as if I was the sole provider of how to recover your pet. Um, and uh, this magazine, Somos Magazine in particular, is for the Hispanic community. And, um, you know, a lot of them, I guess, don't really know about the steps. So uh, I just feel like this <clears throat> this itself uh, relates to this because I feel a lot of people won't know the steps to take. Um, and I feel that they, based on what I was saying, like they feel like they, they really don't know what how to recover their pet as it is. Uh, my understanding from, you know, my reporting was that, you know, if they have a microchip, they, they get to keep them for five days before they start the adoption pr process. So I feel like this would be uh, more adequate if it was in line with that versus the three days. Um, and thank you for having me. Thank you. That's it. Thank you so much, Mr. Bencomo. Any questions? A comment? A comment? Uh, I I think what you just described applies more to the county operation than it does the city of Phoenix. city of Phoenix is uh, where we, we have an animal abuse squad or officers, and we work very closely with the um, Humane Society. And it's usually reports of animal abuse. And I know on several occasions I've had them comment where the neighbors have reported animal abuse, and what's happened is people have just simply moved out, moved away, and left their animals behind, as well as become ill and can't care for them. The city itself did not have a mechanism to step in and legally take care of those on a limited basis. Working with uh, the Humane Society, we could do that now. The county, if it's an abandoned dog, a loose dog, uh, that's a totally different process. And hopefully, we can all communicate better to all the community 
uh, so they know the steps in different situations, who they call for recovery, uh, whether it's City of Phoenix, whether it's animal care and control with the county, uh, because there are private agencies too that will care for some animals. And if somebody's sick and knows they had, so there's no criminal, it doesn't get involved in the city process. It's, this is just an additional uh, layer to protect animals and to help citizens out. So, yeah, if I may add, Ms. Williams, uh, this was related only to dogs, non cruelty, uh, dogs who happen to lose their collar or they happen not to be microchipped. So that's what the re report was about. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now, one of the concerns that he brought up was information in Spanish. Do we have information for Spanish speakers? Yes, we do. Uh, the seizure form, um, I believe, is written in both English and in Spanish, and it has the information on how they can either contact the city courts if they want to have a seizure hearing, or they contact the Humane Society, and our number's on there, in order to contact us to get their animal back. All right, thank you. Any other questions? I'm just having Vice a Mayor. Well, well, thank you so much for the for the update. I I also want want to ensure that we that there is a streamlined communication between the Humane Society and the police department, like getting making sure that we get those animals back to their owners, I think is, is very important, um, especially when, they're, when they've just gone through like a very difficult situation, having their animals back, I think um, is something that we can actually do for folks. I, I am glad that we are cleaning up the city code, but I also want to make sure that we are ensuring a better line of communication between the contracted vendor and the, and the city departments. Right? Like, I mean, our animals are incredibly important, um, and we just need to make sure that we, that we keep those lines of communication open. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Is there a motion? I would move all staff recommendations to change the code to allow this to happen. Is there a second? Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you so much. Now we're on item number 14. Thank you, staff. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. Uh, I'm here this morning to re respectfully request that the Public Safety and Justice Subcommittee recommend to the City Council approval to enter into a contract with Axon Enterprises Incorporated for three specific things, and I'll talk about them individually. Tasers, virtual reality headsets, uh, and our Axon Performance software, which complements our body-worn camera program. Tasers are required for all uniformed officers under the rank of commander, and they are utilized to provide a non-lethal alternative to officers who are faced with active aggression, oftentimes violent, dangerous situations. This affords our op officers the opportunity to de-escalate situations and end encounters peacefully without the use of lethal force. On my left, what you see is the current model, which is the X2 tasers that our officers carry. Uh, the difference is that is in black, our tasers are in yellow, like the one that's on the opposite side. And that's done deliberately since our firearms are black and we don't want there to be any confusion in what is deployed. It's also done deliberately in where they are worn on the uniform so there isn't further confusion. The X2 tasers uh, were first deployed beginning in January of 2013. As noted in the slide, the model has passed its five year useful life. Warranties have expired on this item, and quite frankly, the item is no longer supported. The Taser 7 is the latest technology provided by Axon. You'll notice that slide where it says improved data and analytics. It's important for us as a department leaders within the organization to know how the tasers are utilized. By docking the tasers at the end of shift, we can learn that information very quickly. Also, a supreme focus of ours is enhanced safety and performance. So with regard to improved effectiveness, there's officer safety, fewer officer injuries, a safer community, reducing suspect injuries. As I mentioned before, our mission is to use the least force necessary to effect an arrest or to keep somebody from self-harm. There's built-in de-escalation tools in the device. There's the ARC, 
where if you've seen it utilized, you can push a button and there's an electric arc that sends a very clear sound, sends a message to somebody that they run the risk of being tased. And then there's a laser, a green laser that also lets somebody know that if they continue to engage in the behavior they're engaging in, they run the risk of being tased. Key benefits to the Taser 7 are improved effectiveness, accuracy, and target attachment. At the time we decide, an officer decides to deploy the Taser, we want to end whatever behavior is happening at the end of that encounter. We want the Taser to work. What this technology will do, it increases the probe spread. That means that, and I've mentioned this to some of you previously, what a Taser does is very different than other tools that are on the market, and I'll make this distinction now. Axon has a patent on a neuromuscular central nervous system interrupter. This is not a pain compliance tool. Other tasers that you may see on the market, where colloquially you hear the term taser, that is an electric current that is designed to cause harm, pain. What this causes, it overrides the muscular system so that somebody can no longer engage in the behavior they're engaging in, such as if they have a bat, they have a knife, they have some other weapon that they intend to harm somebody else with or themselves. So ensuring that the tasers have the appropriate spread so it affects the greatest musculature on the body, so it has the most impact, and that it actually penetrates whatever clothing is there so it does what it's intended to do, that's what the seven does over the two. And then with that comes comprehensive reality-based training. You've heard several presentations from us and you'll continue to hear presentations from us about how our training is evolving. Our reality needs to be scenario-based and reality-based and Taser provides that training for us. The next item that I would like to talk about is the virtual reality headset tool. And this is with an emphasis on empathy and de-escalating encounters. You'll see a scenario that's on, on my right that involves a subject that is holding uh, an item in his hand. I actually had the opportunity to go through this scenario using a virtual reality headset. And this was a subject uh, experiencing schizophrenia. And what you see that there are options in this tool right here so the device reacts based on how you engage. This is called three degrees of freedom, which is a virtual reality that exists right now. So it's a three-dimensional, or excuse me, it's a two-dimensional interactive, uh, almost like a video game, if you will. I don't want to diminish its importance, but since we have a lot of young people that play video games, that's what this is. What's on the horizon is what's called six degrees of freedom, which is a fully immersive, reality-based, three-dimensional program that would allow officers to use whatever tools they have on their uniform to resolve situations, hopefully peacefully, but if the situation does not merit, using less than lethal force, using lethal force if necessary. Why this matters, seven to 10 percent, and this is data that's been compiled by reputable sources of all police encounters involve those that are suffering some form of behavioral illness. Depending on the different data sets that I researched, 25 to 50 percent of all fatal police shootings involve subjects with untreated mental or behavioral health issues. When we talk about empathy, being able to connect with a person, if you see what's up there, can we talk versus drop it? Being able to train our officers to connect with a person on a level that disarms them and the situation so the least force necessary is used. From a practical standpoint, when we talk about de-escalation and training, what virtual reality will do is create a limitless number of scenarios. Right now we have a tactical training village that has a lot of uh, opportunity, but you can only do so much with what we have there. You have a one-story home, you have a two-story apartment, you have some other items that are there, but if you've been on the department any length of time, you can only have so many scenarios. You're going to know what the layout is. Virtual reality is limit, li, limitless. And what Axon is willing to give us, to give us at no cost is 194 virtual reality headsets that can be deployed where officers work. So we don't have to bring them down to the academy and waste valuable time as they're driving to and from their work sites. We can provide the training at their work site that is meaningful, that is based on experiences that our officers are encountering on the field today. Axon is willing to work with us to develop those scenarios so they are Phoenix-based scenarios using us as a partner so it isn't some other municipality, it isn't other, some other jurisdiction. The last item I'd like to talk about is the Axon Performance Tool. 
Currently, we have a little over 1,800 body-worn cameras deployed on the Phoenix Police Department. And to provide context, our officers generate over 5,000 individual body-worn camera videos a day. Those 5,000 body-worn camera videos entail roughly 1,400 hours of video daily. It is unrealistic to expect that our supervisors will look at every video that all of our officers are generating every day. I had the opportunity to talk to a patrol supervisor last Friday who's training on his squad. He has 16 officers on his squad. That means there's 16 officers that are wearing body-worn cameras. Our current policy requires that our officers inspect their, our supervisors inspect their officers' uniforms daily to ensure that they are wearing and activating the cameras in accordance with policy. But what we can't do is ensure that every video has been activated in accordance with that policy. Our policy also says that officers must activate their video cameras during any investigative or enforcement contact to include and not limited to, and then it talks about subject stop, vehicle stops, radio calls for service. But what the Axon Performance Tool will do for us, it'll know that Officer Kurtenbach went on 12 calls yesterday and that there should be a minimum of 12 videos associated with Officer Kurtenbach. This will do that real time behind the scenes. All this data exists in the cloud, which is evidence.com, where we store our body-worn camera videos. We just have to have an extraction tool. So what it does, it makes our supervisor review more efficient. We can identify policy issues before they become misconduct. Perhaps we have a training issue that we need to identify with our employees. But if we have some more nefarious activity, we can identify that early. Perhaps an officer doesn't activate his or her camera on certain call types or when engaging certain segments of the population. This will always work behind the scenes to help us identify that, and with that, I believe we have a very powerful policy that's robust, but if there's opportunities for improvement, having additional metrics will help us with policy adoption. Just to provide uh, some additional information, uh, I mentioned previously that Axon owns the patent on this item, which is a central nervous system neuromuscular uh, disruptor. That's why we've elected to pursue a sole source procurement with this vendor. In addition to this item, which is in your packet, that this is a roughly $9 million item spread out over five years. We don't purchase the item. What we do is, in essence, it's a lease over five years, a subscription fee for 3,000 uh, tasers for all uniformed officers. 2,900 is the way it's written in the contract. And then it comes with all the training, all the replacement. If one goes down, we replace it right away. If we use a cartridge, we get a replacement cartridge right away. With regard to the uh, virtual reality, that's five years for free. That affords us the opportunity to develop our training, to take it to the next level entirely for free with the three degrees of freedom that we have right now that exists in technology to the six degrees of freedom that will exist in the future, which I mentioned is that fully immersive 3D training experience and Axon performance, which will ensure compliance with policy. They're willing to give us two years of that for free. Subsequent to that, if we agreed and with council direction, that this is something that we wanted to continue for the next three years of this five-year contract. That's an additional $983,000 a year for those three years for a total of $12,141,000. With that, I'll take any questions you may have. Any questions for my colleagues? Um, Councilmember Garcia? Yeah. So on the VR, because we've been having implicit bias training, different types of training, is it going to be are we going to be able to do different types of trainings in it, or is it just taser-related training that happens on those VR headsets? Uh, Chairman Nowakowski, <clears throat> Council Member Garcia, we are limited by our own imagination. So we can create whatever training benefits us as a department. Okay. Awesome. And then the, the second question is, I think it's great, the, the Exxon performance and being able to f figure that out. But we're also in the process of trying to figure out an early <coughs> intervention system and other updating other things. I just want to make sure that we're cognizant that we want them to talk to each other. So we, we're not then later having to look at three different uh, programs to figure out, you know, that supervisors don't have to go through all this stuff. And so just, I don't know how those technologies will talk to each other. I just want to make sure that as we're, or we're acquiring new technologies that they're talking to each other and we're able to use all the data. Uh, Mr. Chairman and Councilmember Garcia, I, I too am not the most IT savvy person in the world, but I can assure you we will ensure that these systems talk to one another. Uh, to be clear, because you mentioned early intervention, this will not replace early intervention, but it will complement early intervention. 
Any other comments or concerns? I, I make a couple comments. I'm impressed with this technology, and I think it really answers some of the ad hoc committee members' uh, questions. I know that they're very positive about having similar or like uh, technology for the police officers, and if it can reduce fatalities, uh, not only for police officers, but for citizens as well, I fully support this, so thank you. Vice Mayor? Yes, thank you so much for the presentation. I think this definitely complements um, all the changes um, that, that are being made um, in, our, in, our, in our police department. I think having more non-lethal weapons are, is going to help right, with, with the challenges and the issues that we've been dealing with. Um, so thank you. I, I'm also very supportive of this, of this item. So Assistant Chief, I'm very supportive also, but it's a big ticket item also. So I'd like to figure out where's the money coming from? Is, it, is there other programs in the future that are going to be cut because of the funding? Um, could you answer some of those questions? So Mr. Chairman, what I can tell you is that there's the availability in the budget, the police department budget to pay for this item. What we're going to do is we're able to use court award funds in year one. Mm -hmm. So that won't touch the general fund. Uh, those come from seizures from the police department that are already allocated to us to pay for year one of the contract. So that's one point, roughly a little over $1.8 million in year one that we'll be able to pay. Uh, and then we will work with budget and research beyond that to determine which fund or funds, whether it be general fund, one of the police department specialty funds to pay for this. But it's very important to understand that we are going to take this right out of our court award funds in year one. That's 1.8 million, right? Yes, sir. And where's the other 11 million coming from? So that will be discussion, uh, Mr. Chairman, again, with budget and research to determine which one of the funds that will come out of uh, over the five years. So would I be guaranteed that it's not cutting police officers in the future recruitment of police officers and that will keep the uh, number of officers that we're, we're in goal. Our goal is to have, what is it, 3,000? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, we will hit 3,125 filled in calendar year 20, which is our current authorized number. Chairman Nowakowski, members of the subcommittee, um, this item, as Mike mentioned, will be funded in year one out of the court awards fund. Beyond that, years two, three, four, and five, we will work that into our normal budget process. So when I come to you in February, and I come to you in March with my five-year forecast, this will be baked into that number. So I will take this in. It won't, it won't make my cut positions or future hires or anything like that. It'll just be baked into my status going forward for the general fund. All right, any other comments? Councilmember Garcia? Yeah, um, just a, a comment around uh, the, the funding piece. Uh, so how, how much did we spend on tasers before and was that a reoccurring uh, cost or was it five years ago we just bought them all and that was it? So uh, Chairman Nelkowski, Council Member Garcia, I can answer that. At the time five years ago when we entered this contract, we had the ability to purchase them. So we purchased them at that time. It was five payments of a little over $664,000 a year, a little over $3.3 million uh, was the total at that time. I just want to make sure that it doesn't affect our 3,125 police officers. And I know there's other things that we need up there. I just took a tour on our, um, our flight, our helicopters and, and planes that we have that is a crucial tool that we're looking at an old fleet that we need to bring up to par. So those other programs I hope are not going to be cut out of, out of the budget in the future that we can continue looking at those improvements that we need in other places. With that, um, is there a motion? I move approval of staff's recommendation. Second. Any discussion on that? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you so much. We're on item number 15. All yours, Chief. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. Um, this item is to ask the subcommittee for a recommendation to extend a contract for red light and photo speed enforcement with Redflex. So right now we have a contract that was awarded in October um, of 2014 and it expires at the end of this calendar year. Right now this program includes 12 fixed light locations and it also includes eight mobile speed vehicles. And these vehicles are used in school zones to enforce the 15 mile per hour um, law. So by extending the existing contract, this is going to allow for us to do a new solicitation process. Um, what we're looking at is a four-month extension, and then if needed, we'll extend it six months on a month-to-month -month basis. We'll be asking for payment authority of about $700,000, and this is based on the current contract pricing. Um, we are planning to take this to council for um, approval on January 18th um, of 2019. So, hmm? 2020. 2020, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, December of, December 18th of 2019, let me be clear. All right, so now I wanna step back and talk about um, the current procurement process and a little bit of background information in April of 2019 um, this subcommittee recommended that we issue an RFP um, and that we look at putting some flexibility into the solicitation process where we could increase the number of fixed light cameras up to 24 locations and also increase the number of mobile speed vehicles up to 16. This would basically double the program size so that is currently in the RFP that's on the street. Um, the new RFP responses are due January of 2020, and this RFP can still be amended. I want to make clear that there is flexibility in the RFP to either increase or decrease the program, and there's also some options for additional photo radar enforcement products and services. This would include enforcement at bus stops, um, perhaps, or even construction zones, or even light rail stations. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chief Kornbach to talk about the program. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, the purpose statement of the Phoenix Police Department is to ensure safety and security for each person in our community. And one of the ways we do that is through the deployment of this technology. What this technology allows us to do in the 12 intersections that it currently exists is to reduce traffic collisions uh, to gain voluntary compliance because people know where these cameras are located and hopefully save lives and reduce injury. The header of this slide is a little bit misleading because it says 2018 crash data. The data that I'm going to go over is three years of data that includes 2018, so 2016, 2017, and 2018, compared to the three years prior. And what that shows at these photo-enforced intersections is a 30, nearly 31% reduction in collisions and a corresponding 30% reduction in injuries fatalities. Now back in uh, 2015, there were nine new locations that were added as part of this 12-camera uh, deployment. And if you're familiar with the manner of deployment, the cameras don't cover all four directions. But in the directions that the camera does cover, and this is, I think it's very important to understand that we realized a 57% reduction in red light running crashes in that direction of travel. From a police department standpoint, whose job is to ensure safety and security, this is a very meaningful number, especially when you consider that red light crashes tend to be very violent collisions that almost always result in injury. So again, what we're asking for is a recommendation to the City Council to extend the existing contract with Redflex traffic systems. And again, this would allow us for a new solicitation. Um, we're looking at a four-month extension um, and if needed, for an additional six months on a month-to-month -month basis. And with that, we'll answer any questions. Do I have any questions for my colleague, uh, Councilmember Garcia? I had asked a question if we could separate the two. Um, I don't know if we have an answer to separating the vans to the red light cameras. Uh, yes. Um, so what we've... What we've um, learned is that we can definitely make that separation in the new solicitation that's on the street. 
um, we can make that amendment to the RFP. Um, but we are still going to have to have some discussions if we were going to try to implement that in the extension. Again, this contract um, expires at the end of this calendar year. So we're going to have to work with Redflex to see if there's any changing changes in the pricing. So we're still in conversations with them. I have a couple um, questions. So um, Council Member DeCicio asked for the top 10 um, intersections that have um, serious accidents, fatal um, collisions, right? So the top 10 are 27th Avenue in Beersley. That's in District 1. Do we have a a camera there on that intersection. Mr. Chair, members uh -huh. of the subcommittee, no, we do not have um, a red light camera at that intersection. So then how about on 43rd and Northern, which is in District um, 1 and 5? Currently, no, we do not have one at that intersection. And how about on 51st and Thunderbird, that's in District 1? Currently, we do not have one at that intersection as well. And on 27th Avenue and Camelback, that's in District 4 and 5? Not at that intersection as well. And then how about this, um, 15th Avenue and Indian School, District 4? We do not have a camera at that location as well. And 16th Street and Broadway? We do not have a camera at that location as well. And Cave Creek Road and Greenway? We do not have a camera at that intersection as well. I just read you off. Probably the 10, is that 10? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, oh, here's some more. 67th Avenue and Thomas. We do not have one at that intersection as well. And 43rd and McDowell. We do not have one at that intersection as well. And 43rd and Peoria. We also do not have one at that intersection as well. So one of the concerns I have is that when it was brought to us, it was about going into some of the worst areas of traffic where there were some major accidents and fatal collisions. And I just read you off the top 10 that was provided from staff um, going back from 2014 to 2018 plus, it says. So um, just reading off those 10, um, it seems like District 1 has four of the major um, Areas, District 2 has 2, District 3 has 3, District 4 has 3, District 5 has 3, District 6 has 0, District 7 has 1, and District 8 has 1. So, um, and then I looked into the areas where the cameras are now, and they were removed, and it looks like you have twice as much in District 4, 5, um, seven and eight, which happens to be more of the um, low-income minority areas. So I'm not sure what the strategy is there. And also, Councilmember DeCicio asked for um, the times of the um, yellow lights. So basically the clearing time, I guess it's called. Uh, we have some areas that have 3.6 and other areas that have five points. Um, seconds. So why is there a difference between probably a second and a half from some areas to other areas? And who adjusts the um, that timing? Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, um, the yellow clearance time is based on a national standard. It's the Institute of Transportation um, Engineers Handbook. Um, it is a standard that is also adopted by Arizona Department of Transportation, so the state. So the yellow clearance time has a minimum of three seconds and a maximum of uh, five seconds and is based on the posted speed limit. So for example, if the posted speed limit is 40 miles per hour on the roadway, the yellow clearance time would be four seconds. And as far as the um, signal timing, that is done through the Street Transportation Department. All right, thank you. Any other questions from my colleagues? Council Member Garcia. I just have <clears throat> more comments than, than questions. Um, I think I don't want to continue to support something that, that doesn't seem to be equitable of where it's at. I think this process has become an industry. It's uh, essentially criminalized people and put them in a pathway to stay in the court system. Um, what happens with red light tickets is that you're mandated to take a class, which means you have to take a day off of work or figure out online services to do it then. 
Um, and it also just kind of reoccurring cycle that leads people to poverty. And, and it, it seems more of a, I'm gonna put it this way, but of a poor tax rather than actual policy to, to, to keep people safe. I think there's other ways. Uh, we had the opportunity to look at Vision Zero earlier in the year, it was previous to I was on council. I think there's some parts in that that speak to how to keep people safe, extending yellow lights and doing different things. I really want to differentiate the vans in the schools from the red light cameras, but so long as they're in the same bucket, um, it would be really hard for me to to uh, to accept something that has the, the red light cameras in it. And so I'll, I would, I don't know, motioning yet, but uh, I'd be against uh, moving this item forward. Vice Mayor. Yeah, I would also um, like to advocate if there's a way, because um, given Given these new, given these numbers, um, there's some inconsistency and some cleanup that actually we, I think that we need to do with the with the red light cameras. But I would definitely would not be in favor to get um, rid of the vans. I have two young children, um, so I see the importance of the vans um, in front of, in front of the schools. I think we also um, need to look a little bit more into pedestrian safety, right? Like one of the reports that I saw earlier in the year is that we have more pedestrian accidents than we than we, we do auto um so i would like to see something around that um at, at this point i would i would consider a motion to continue to continue with the vans in the schools but then that we really look into like how do we distribute the lights before before we move on with with, with the red light cameras so i i would like to make a motion to to move with the vans and put the red lights on hold uh, can I ask a question? Because yeah. I think Absolutely. you said you can't do that at this point in the current contract. It would be in the new contract when it's done, but it's a joint venture on this contract. So right. We would so have maybe to... we would end the one we have and start a new one in January. Okay. So then we, it could be. Can yeah. we address staff? Can it be? Is it possible to separate it Thank until you, we Mr. figure Chair. out the? Um, Separating the vans for, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman um, and members of the subcommittee. So um, as I said, we're going to have to have more conversations with Redflex to build that change into the existing contract. Again, that contract expires at the end of December, which isn't a lot of time. Um, we will work towards doing that. Um, but one option is that we extend that contract for four months. That allows us to continue with the new solicitation process, we can definitely pull apart the vans in the RFP that's on the street currently, and then bring that forward to the council for approval once we get the, the evaluation completed. We have two cards. Should I go ahead and go to the cards first? Yep. And then we'll continue the conversation. Did she amend her motion? Did you? Yeah, no, I think so. I think if we, I, I just, oh, sorry. I think um, I think we do have to look into um, stopping the red lights for now and continuing with the with with, with the vans at the at, at the schools after this after contract. after this contract is done in December. Okay. Is there a second on that? I'll second. All right. We have a second, and then we have some um, committee input. Um, we have Mr. and Mrs. Grossman. If you like to speak. Let's come up to the microphone. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman Good morning. and all council members and everybody here. I'm Deborah Grossman. I'm a, a traffic teacher here in the city of Phoenix. And every week I hear concerns and fears from my students. Sometimes I feel their pulse when they share their accident stories with me. Just recently, one of my students in the traffic survival class, the class that requires red light runners, the class that Council Member Garcia referred to, <coughs> one of my students who was recently involved in a serious crash for running a red light, he ran the red light, and he sustained very serious injuries to his back. He shared MRI pictures of screws and staples that were installed in his back. He said to the class, had there been a camera at that intersection, this crash happened at an intersection that had no camera. 
He said, had there been a camera and he knew it, he would not have run the red light and he would have been spared. Today, he can barely walk. So I ask all of you to consider this very deeply. We need these cameras to protect those that run the red lights too and the innocents that have their lives robbed from them. I ask you to consider this and to pass your vote to extend the camera contract, approve the funds that they are requesting, and add more cameras on those intersections that do not have cameras. We need them in the city of Phoenix. It's very dangerous to drive in this city. So please find a way. Find a way to come to terms and approve this instead of making our city less safe. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Mr. Grissom. Good morning. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to address the council uh, subcommittee. Uh, my name is Robert Grossman, Central Phoenix Traffic School. I've devoted this last chapter of my professional life to traffic safety in the city of Phoenix. Uh, the city of Phoenix is a uniquely dangerous place to drive an automobile. The state of Arizona also, the number one city in the nation for pedestrian fatalities the number one city in the nation for red light running, the most dangerous railroad crossing in the entire nation found in the city of Phoenix. This is the last place photo enforcement should be taken away from. People are concerned for pedestrians and school children. Pedestrians and school children also cross the street. Uh, they cross the street at intersections where people run red lights. I encourage you, I can't be more sincere about this, please, don't curtail the use of red light photo enforcement in the city of Phoenix. We need an expansion, not a reduction. Um, every time this comes up in my class over the last several weeks, I have students asking me, given these statistics, why did the Phoenix City Council vote to remove these cameras from our streets? What am I supposed to tell them? The city of Phoenix doesn't care about traffic safety, would prefer that you purchase insurance for both your automobile and your health? Is that the message you would like me to deliver? If it's a different message, I hope the message is safety. And if you're interested in the safety of our pedestrians, our motorists, our, our school children, please extend and expand the red light photo enforcement program. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Just to respond to some of your questions, um, basically we just asked our staff about the 10 uh, most dangerous intersections and not one red camera is there. So, you know, if we were putting these into the most dangerous areas in our city of Phoenix to prevent accidents and save lives, then why aren't they in the top 10? So that's the concern I have as a council member that's allocating these monies to make sure that we save lives and we prevent accidents. So those are the type of questions that we are asking. We haven't gotten the right answer to it. I'm just responding back to you. You don't have Can to. I re if you'd like to, yes, sir. Oh, certainly. Does the Phoenix City Council have any authority to help direct the cameras to areas they think are important? Well, I think that's the conversation we're trying to have here. And that the other concern is that we need to make sure that they are in those areas, right? Number one. And that we need to look at why has, who made the decision of moving those cameras and putting them in those locations that they are and figure out the logic behind it. If there is some type of a logic or some kind of pattern there, we should know why, right? So um, basically, as, as a chair of public safety, I don't understand why they were placed in those locations that they're in right now. I'm in favor of doubling it or even tripling it as long as it makes sense and as long as you, you explain to us why those locations and how it's gonna save lives and prevent accidents. With that, Council Member Garcia. I, I don't want people to, un, to conflict that we don't care about people's safety. I think my issues are particularly with the entire industry that's been created, from the people that serve people, from the schools such as where you work at, um, that are taking advantage of this uh, with people that are of low income. And so my concerns are with how do we stop criminalizing, how we stop keeping uh, how do we stop from keeping people poor and in the system and actually create education that is proactive, that is 
that we could, as a society, look for better ways. Again, I, sh I showed the example of, of Vision Zero and other ways in which we could create a safer uh, Phoenix for pedestrians and car accidents without punishing, without criminalizing, without forcing people to have to be part of these programs and, and waste their hard-earned money on, on these classes. And that, so that's, that's why I uh, why, wish to stop these cameras. We'll go with the Vice Mayor, then Council Member Williams. I, th I think um, I think for me personally like I just I just want to make sure that we have the right amount of cameras right because I wouldn't want to extend this and then think like oh my god now we need more um, I just I just want to I want to keep the city safe I want to keep our pedestrians safe like I said I have two young children and I get it that it's incredibly important to have these cameras but I think like like someone made the comment I think um, city council has to as council members and that are out in our in our communities like we need to have a little bit more of a say where the cameras cameras are going given given the numbers and the statistics of where we need the cameras to go like I will definitely be in favor of placing the cameras once we take a real like strong look of where is it that these cameras need to be placed and I'm hoping that we'll be able to move on this like really fast so we can get them back um, out in the streets as soon as possible hold on for a second um Councilmember Williams. Uh, yeah, I have a little different position than some of the other members on this committee. And I just want to make it clear, I second the motion because I really think it's important we extend uh, for both through this contract. Uh, I do not agree with separating them. I think we need all of the red light cameras we can possibly get. I would like to see them at least doubled. And I'm making an assumption, it could be totally wrong, that one of the reasons there's where the cameras are now, there are fewer accidents because they're effective, and that the list that Councilman DeCicio got of the next highest ones that deserve um, a placement of a camera there, that we consider that and move forward with this. I truly believe it saves lives, <clears throat> reduces accidents, because people see the sign posted, red light camera, and they pay attention to that. We've got them trained. Uh, we just don't have enough of them. And as the city's grown, uh, I think we need the placement further spread out around the uh, suburbs. I'm sure Levine could probably use mm -hmm. one. I know uh, District 2, District 1, and District 3 could use some more. Uh, but I fully support that as well as the school cameras. The potential of having double the number of cameras at schools I think is terrific. So I'm supporting the motion today, but I do not agree with the separation and fewer cameras. Could I get clarity on the motion if, if it <clears throat> is to extend? Because I, I don't think that's what, was that what it was? I mean, it, the, motion, the motion was to separate, let, let me get this correctly, to separate, to stop the red light cameras and to continue with with the vans, whether it is starting a new contract or whether it is extending the one that we have. But we can't do that. Mr. Chairman, um, so perhaps a point of clarification, if the CFO gets word from the vendor, they're not willing to separate during an extension, would you still want us to stop or would you want us to continue until we get to the next round? Well, Milton, the concern I have is that 10 out of the 12 locations had zero, zero accidents and fatal, <coughs> fatal accidents at those locations three years prior yes, of in, and putting those cameras there. I just read you the top 10 areas. So I'm not understanding how those areas were chosen if there was zero accidents at 10 of those locations. So it doesn't make sense. Okay. So I, what I like to do is I like to have staff come back Mm -hmm. to us with some kind of a strategic plan, help us understand why we're spending these tax dollars and trying to save lives. Are they really saving lives? Um, are, are, are we going with fees or I'm not sure what's happening here. But I wanna make sure that we're putting them in strategic locations that if we have to add more, we should add more. Um, but the biggest concern we have now is that Children are probably out of school until for the um, Christmas holidays or yes. so. 
So I believe that when they get back, that we should have those those vans in front of the schools. And I think that's what the vice mayor is saying. So if the vendor is not able to do that, is there another vendor that we can actually turn to? Or I'm not sure if it we're able to do that during this period of research. Mr. Chair. Yes. I want to at first ask a question, but then I want to make a substitute motion. Okay. Uh, has the solicitation gone out? So currently we have an RFP that's on the street. Okay. Um, those proposals are due back on January, I believe it's third. So we can definitely come back to the subcommittee with any of this information that you've been talking about. Um, and we can definitely do that before we award the new contract. Right. Okay. Um, but again, right now we have an existing contract that we need to figure out whether we extend it or not until we can get that process completed. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a substitute motion to extend the current contract um, with the payment of $700,000 as written while you can go through the bidding process and bring back the information to us. We have a motion. Is there a second? Can we have those questions um, that I addressed answered? Is there a possibility of, of separating that? And if there isn't, can we temporarily find somebody in that period of time to, to cover the school zones? Mr. Chair, members of the subcommittee, we can we can try to do this. Um, again, the contract expires at the end of December, um, and then the new solicitation is due to us at the beginning of January. So we can come up with some, some options um, for the council to look at. But we don't have a lot of time. We may have a situation where the contract expires and we have nothing in place until we can get something figured out. Now, once those... Um RFP is finished on the 3rd. How fast can you get it to the council for a vote? I would anticipate something coming to the council at the end of March or perhaps beginning of April. Um, again, we would like to have some of those questions that you've brought up addressed right. prior to that conversation. Already. My motion failed? Yeah. Okay. It seems like the motion failed, and we're going to the original motion. Sorry, ma'am. We. Okay. Yeah. Any other comments? Yeah, so, so long as the, the red lights are still in place, so the locations where they're at, I, I would be opposed to, to the original motion. And I, I would also like to, um, again, emphasize um, what council member, I, I'm sorry, what, what the chairman is saying is is hoping that we be able to find someone to really do the vans at the schools. So with that, we'll take a motion. I mean, we'll take a, a vote on the vice mayor's motion. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. Nay. So it looks like the ayes have it. Motion carries. Thank you. But that, so just to be clear, that's, we're unable to do that, right? The motion that was put forth, we're unable to separate. We can't continue the contract now with separation. That's what they're going to find out. That's what they're yeah. going to Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, I will work really hard with the vendor to see yeah. if we can get this to work. <laughs> All right, with that, we're on the... Um, any call to the public? All right, we have no additional cards. Next is future agenda items. Do we have any future agenda items? Mr. Chairman, the one uh, item that's currently there is the median pedestrian safety law that was originally on this agenda but was pulled, so that would come back in January. Okay. Anything else? I think just what the point of information I called for earlier, I don't know if it's Necessity to be an agenda item, or if we could just get a report on the ICE numbers. Would you like to have some kind of presentation at, at the subcommittee, or? 
I think you so. just want to report. I mean, I, I, I like to see like what's the procedure once all of that. Yeah, that, that would be good. Just a better understanding, and then in particular, the AG Bernovich's decision and how we're interpreting it. Yes. Any other future agenda items? With that, meeting's adjourned. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Purcell has been putting on every, for the last five years or so. Um, it's at Maryville Desert West um, Park. It's for, uh, for children with mentally, it's a mentally um, health fair, mentally ill health fair for individuals that want to come out and stuff. So um, thank you, Chief, for reminding me about that.